What's up, everyone? Welcome to my corner of the internet. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is Crossover Commerce, presented by Ping Pong Payments, the leading global payments provider helping sellers keep more of their hard-earned money. What's up, everyone? I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and welcome to another episode of Crossover Commerce, episode 68, live here with uh, presented by Ping Pong Payments. Ping Pong provides marketplace sellers and entrepreneurs global solutions for controlling their domestic and international funds. An account with Ping Pong enables companies to significantly reduce their costs, whether making international payments or receiving them all in one platform to help increase operational efficiencies, save time, and allow sellers to manage their business profiles from one single source. For more information, just go ahead and check that link below in the comments section for more information on how to save on your international FX. Go ahead and check out Ping Pong and sign up for a free account today. Uh, thanks for joining us live again on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Or if you're listening to this on Team Replay, welcome to watching whenever you could to consume content. Or if you downloaded this and are listening to us on Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts, truly wherever you can consume and listen to your podcast, that's where we'll be. You can listen and download us. Just search for Crossover Commerce wherever you consume those podcasts. Do me a favor and follow, like, and share this episode along with our social media um, pages. Crossover Commerce has a new uh, Facebook page, so go ahead and make sure you follow and like that. I post all my e-commerce thoughts and our episodes live there so you can consume all in one place. But we go live about four to five times per week, so you don't want to miss a single episode of any of our guests that are coming up on the show. And again, you can go back and look at that archive on our YouTube channel, just search Ping Pong Payments in our YouTube. Just go ahead, subscribe to the channel, and then make sure that the bell is uh, smashed so that you can get notified whenever we go live with an uh, episode. Um, if you can't catch this live again, you can watch us at another time. But about our guest today, I'm very excited because he himself is a podcaster, so he has so much information and knowledge about himself, can look at a, a landscape and get a, us and insiders tip and what he's seeing and listening from other top-minded e-commerce and Amazon sellers as well. But our uh, guest today is the founder of My Amazon Guy. He started his career as a TV radio uh, reporter in Ohio, uh, not Ohio, Idaho, which is, of course, a huge market, but that's, you got to start somewhere, right, everyone? Then he was an e-commerce director for about 10 years for brands ranging from gold and silver coins to women's plus size clothing. And after dozens of requests to uh, side hustle consult for Amazon clients. He started the agency to make it easier to growth hack the platform. He owns MAG, My Refund Guy, a clawback, clawback FBA service, and uh, Momster, uh, mo a private label FBA wine glass brand. He has more than 600 tutorial videos on YouTube, which is just a little bit of content. Uh, obviously way more than what a lot of people are pumping out there. So he knows the stuff and he is showing how to handle any problem uh, faced on Amazon. He is a host of a podcast that with interviews, other Amazon experts, of course, in his agency it has 160 plus clients that are full service uh, Amazon agency there in Atlanta, Georgia. Go ahead and welcome. I want to welcome to our show, Stephen Pope of my Amazon guy, Stephen. What is up, man? How are you? Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. Yeah. From Atlanta, Georgia. That's where you're located, right? That's that's right. Yeah. Up in the North awesome. Atlanta area. Awesome. So have you been there like your whole life or what, what was I, it like? Five moving years. Or stuff there? Yeah. Five so, years? so my my father was a weatherman and we followed in his footsteps across the country. So this is actually my second time living in Atlanta. I used to work for the okay. Weather Channel in Atlanta and okay. took us all over the country. And then when I started my career, I went and did the same thing as a TV reporter and I traveled the country as well. So Idaho, Wisconsin, then I went into marketing, met my wife in Maryland, did a sin in Oklahoma. And now we're in Atlanta. This is home now. Okay. I was going to say for now it, it's home. It sounds like, but you're just <laughs> making your way around. It sounds like the North and the East coast now that down the South. That's awesome. So why Atlanta? Uh, that was just the last business that brought me here. One of my last failed startups. It was a lighting company and, and I love working for startups. I have a hunkering for it. And so I guess that's why when I worked for my fourth field startup and and that didn't work out I, and, and and I would go in and I'd grow marketplaces, but there'd always be some other piece of the equation that failed. Right. And you right. can't control everything when you control one piece of the puzzle. So I said, OK, uh, maybe I'll do this for myself now. And I and I created the agency, my Amazon guy, three years ago, almost to the day coming up on our three year anniversary on April 2nd. Nice. 
And, and uh, the first client that we signed, um, signed within 48 hours of me announcing on LinkedIn, hey guys, I'm starting an agency. And, <laughs> and, 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 and they're still a client today. And we grew that wow. from zero to 600K a month in sales. Fantastic. That's awesome. So what, what was it that like, um, where, where'd that expertise come from? Was it just like hitting the ground and like you said, all those failed startups and just selling on Amazon and that's the natural next step in progression. I'm going to do this for other people. Yes. I mean, I, I helped uh, countless other companies grow their Amazon brand, both on the corporate side and then side hustle consulting, right? So you work for one failed startup and the VPs all go different directions. And then they, they're they like, hey, you know, Steven, I need you to help me at this company. And then just snowball from there. One of my biggest referral trees is 57 deep. And I have it mapped out because I was just fascinated by this one referral tree that started this with person, this person. Yeah. Yep. And, wow. and, and it's just amazing to see. So there's, there's, there's a lot of people um, who have been key to my success in growing the business. Kevin Strawbridge was the first person that helped me get my first client. Um, Stephen Crane runs and, and has referred in like 15 businesses to my business. Tyler Jeffcoat at Seller Accountant. Just right. so many different people that helped me build the business and attract good people and good clients. Tyler will be on the show tomorrow, actually. That, that so, is awesome. And he's good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> somehow, somehow, always ever, someone mentions the next person like, oh, yeah, this person inspired me. I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to him next week. I'll make sure I... I mentioned this progression of people. So that that's the train I'm running. Like you said, 50, you're getting around, Ryan. you're getting around. Yeah, well, that, that's why I feel like I'm, I'm like, I'm the person like they come to like, Hey, who's, who's got a podcast we can hop on. Oh, this person hasn't been on. So, uh, do you ever feel that way as like, what made you start a podcast? Like, is it, is it something that you just wanted to share more content? Is this like the easiest way to get your information out to people? You want to have more of an interaction with uh guest? What was that like? So the, so three years ago, almost to the day again on this question, I, I I knew that there were multiple problems to running an Amazon business. And I just started creating content out of, uh, on it. You know, how to build a brand store is one of my first most popular videos. And I was like first to market, like explaining drag and drop this and goes here and do that. And here's why you build it that way. Right. I'm not a designer. I'm just a hustler and a marketer. And, right. and so I have a vision that if if I built a bunch of content, people would pay attention and I would build a business off that. So that's the whole hypothesis. The first sure. year and a half, I think that I probably didn't generate a single sale off a of YouTube video. It was probably completely 100% referral based mm -hmm. and just people coming in and referring business our way. But since then, it's almost 80%, 90% off of the content now. And so it takes a while to build an audience and build a community. And it took me a while to feel my find my voice, right? So like, I'm constantly trying to figure out what my voice is today. Like I'm still all over the place, right? So like right. I started a weekly Q and A, I have a weekend rant, I bring in guests and, and I really don't know like where my most valuable content is coming from. I just do a lot of it, but it started out as an afterthought where I would build out an answer to a question or a problem on Amazon. And then mm -hmm. it became um, a thought leadership tool, right? So like, for example, I, I am talking about Amazon aggregators nonstop right now because you have the Chinese coming in from the left and they're lowering prices and and pinching your pennies because of the commodity pricing and they're going to go direct to consumer. So you got them coming in from the left. And then in mm -hmm. from the right, you've got Amazon aggregators, which raised like $2 billion just in the month of February alone. Yeah, I was going to say just in this past month or two. And, and, and then they're going to increase your competition. Now, I you know I freaked out in the last 60 days, not going to lie. Like I was like, wow, how how is the space going to evolve this year? Like what's happening? But I see a little baseball figurine in the background. So I think right. we're I think we're in the second inning. I don't think we're deep in the fifth yet. And we're just beginning. And so I talked to 20 aggregators. I interviewed them, figured out where they are. And I'll be honest, uh, I think most of them don't know what they're doing yet. And, and uh, you know, you know I sound like a lot like when I'm behind closed doors. So I was like, this is my perception versus like, this is exciting, too. But yes. like. People are even talking what like a hundred. They say a hundred. It's not all the same. Like they're going after the same people. It's different aggregators or quote unquote roll ups, if you will. They're specializing in certain categories or one specific. Like if it's just building your portfolio. And we've had a lot of them on here, like Thrasio, uh, Elevate Brands. We've had we're gonna have foreign brands on. We'll have um, for, uh, Fortunate. Uh, just just all these ones keep popping up. I'm like, well, I need to understand like why they are doing this because yes. they just like Amazon sellers, right? They have to differentiate themselves from the market. What is that going to be like? So, what, so, I yeah. so I think some aggregators are going to do it right. They're going to build the expertise and they're going to build those brands up. And those are the those are the aggregators that are going to be around in five years from now. 
Mm -hmm. Then there's the other aggregators that are probably going to go out and buy a bunch of brands and then roll them up and sell to another aggregator. And they're going to be gone in a year or two. Okay. So, so the market forces right now are very volatile. Now, me personally, I'm very bullish for anybody involved. You, me, mom and pops, the aggregators and the Chinese. I think we're all going to win in the next two years. How that shakes out and how the market shifts, anybody's guess. But I do not believe the aggregators are going to buy everything. So one of the one of the thoughts I had is, OK, do I start mag elite and go start chasing the aggregators? And, and of course, I'm doing that behind the scenes um, and trying to figure out how to make that happen. Or do I stay true to my core, which is 160 mom and pops, you know, and and be the last bastion for the mom and pop Amazon sellers? And right. that's that's really where my passion has been. Um, and I, I want to diversify the portfolio and protect it. But at the end of the day, the content that I'm building can be um, be understood by everybody. And I speak plainly. I'm true to my word. I'm very Gary V style esque um, without the cussing. And <laughs> and and I, I say, do you do you put out your cell phone number so people can text you at all hours of the oh night? Oh my goodness. Um, so, so I got the biggest problem that I face right now is that our sales funnel is just out of control. Um, and we are signing clients. Like we just raised our prices, right? Like nobody wants to announce that publicly, right? Like we just right. raised our prices. Like you, you have to do it. I had yeah. to. And, and, uh, I had to remove my cell phone from my signature. I'm, I'm in the process of getting out of operations because I'm trying to become more of a founder. Like these business challenges, there's not a lot of public discourse on this, right? So like I'm trying to take my company from uh, you know uh, a certain point and and leapfrog to three exit over the next year or two and 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 the barrier that I'm hitting right now is substantial. It's the hardest barrier that an entrepreneur goes through, and I didn't even know that until like 30 days ago. Growth, right? right. Essentially, yeah. growth. Yeah. And, and and so so like it takes so much longer for operations to catch up to a sales funnel, and 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 like we thought January was going to be down. We thought, oh. Like uh, agencies lose ten percent in January, but in reality it was up thirty five percent and another thirty five this month from the previous month. And so, right. like month month, yeah, exactly. That's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome what you guys are doing. But why? Why is that for you guys? It's a great problem to have. But but really, um, you know, just to add value to your audience. It's it's this has nothing to do with me. Why am I talking about all this? It has nothing to do with the fact that we're coming out ahead. The symptoms that I'm talking about here is, is helpful for everybody to understand. If my business is exceptionally growing out of control, then so are everybody else's business and pain points. The talent required to run your Amazon business is increasingly difficult to find. And the Amazon policies and barriers to entry are at an all-time high. Your competition is also at an all-time high. And your complexities to manage all of this with your margins at an all-time low. And so we're going to see a ton of roll-ups over the next two years, a ton of them. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, so it behooves everybody involved in this process, soup to nuts, to just protect your brand and understand like where, where you're going. So maybe working backwards, if you will, like the per, the the company that's eventually going to exit. Let's work backwards, and then obviously let's maybe that's how we say stick six steps ahead of our competition to eventually get to that point of like exiting. Who are the bit? Who are the aggregators that you think are doing it right right now? Like, is it fair to call out specific ones, or is it too early to say like, uh, hey, they're doing they're doing business 100%. right? Yeah, without a doubt, Thrasio is so far ahead of everybody. And, and the proof is the, the the fact that they're in round two. They got a billion and then they got another 750 million, right? So like it's the, the numbers don't lie. They know what they're doing, right? So what Thrasio did was they built their own internal teams and they got a lot of things wrong at first. They, they operated in the shadows. And then all of a sudden they came out public and be like, we buy Amazon brands. And they showed up at conferences and everything else. And just, just that's what they did. And because they were first to market on the concept, and they were so far ahead of everybody, they have the infrastructure. The mm -hmm. most of the other aggregators do not have the infrastructure to run the Amazon brands today. And, and so uh, they're going to have to quickly build it themselves or acquire it. So they're going to have to go buy another agency. They're going to have to buy brands that have operators that will stay on. Whatever it is, they're going to have to solve for it. Because as, as you know, one of the biggest lies that I think is told in, in the Amazon YouTube world is that Everybody can sell on Amazon and make money. That is false. That's a lie. I will indict that all day long. Amazon is not passive income. It's not. It's 
it, it's a like, full-time job. It's a full-time career choice and yeah. it is quite lucrative. But if, but if you are listening to this and you're above the age of 60, this is not your retirement plan. Do not <laughs> invest. Please don't. This is, this is our financial advice. Do not do that. <laughs> and, you, you might, you, you might find that you're working multiple jobs more so than when you did when you're not retired. And, and it, it takes it takes the skill set of doing operations and marketing and finance. And if you don't get at least the C minus in all three of those and an A in one of them, your business is done for. And yeah. and the operations is extremely difficult by itself. But I'm the marketer and that's why people hire my Amazon guy. We, we end up being their marketing wing. Um, so generally speaking, we usually work with people that are good at operations but need help with the marketing. Um, but but the financial questions are also interesting too because you know where do you get your money? How do you how do you fund those other ten product ideas? Right, like I got a closet behind me with all my failed products and all of the products I want to launch, but but don't have time to do it. Every entrepreneur does, right? And and there's different target markets and everything that's involved in that. But um, marketing should be polarizing, by the way. Uh, and and if I'm polarizing your audience, that's a good thing. Yeah. Right? So. so yeah. So w- w- when you're looking at that, like obviously so much is like ebbed and flowed in this time. My personal take is, is when you have people like Thrasio and whatnot, they're using these tools, they're going to start. It's almost like I take a sports analogy. I know we can go back to chess, but like you take it like a farm system, right? You start cultivating these sellers from the very beginning. You either build out your own set of tools or like software and whatnot, you either acquire those people. For example, Thrasio one day walked up to Jungle Scout or Helium 10, they say, this is how much we're going to purchase for you. You can start to conceptualize, hey, one to three years sellers from the beginning, they look profitable. Hey, by the way, we're going to offer you the quickest and best offer because we know the ins and outs with our tool, our tool sets. They get the that like snapshot of what's profitable, then can purchase it outright and kind of move them on. That's kind of what I have predicted. Does that mean that it will happen? Not necessarily, but they have so much manpower, like you said, in terms of like operations, marketing, just sheer money, where, where do you think that they innovate from, from the Amazon space as well? Is it, is it just buying companies like service providers and agencies or is it innovating other places? Do you think? Well, I I mean, like Thrasio has some public use case studies where they, they buy brands and then increase their profitability um, and increase the scale, right? So like with one company that they're very public with, Um, They redid the packaging of an item and and then they watered the product down. I don't think they're public about the second part, but um, but they watered the product down, made it less potent and increased the margins and drastically increased the marketing conversion rates. And it was was literally just a packaging change. Right. So taking hard data looks and trying to figure out how to crack the code of Amazon is something that anybody who wants to compete in 2021 needs to do. Right. So I'll give you an example. If you're selling a product such as, um, you know, a little blowtorch to make cream belay, right? And if you were doing this and you you look at the brand analytics, and this is this is a real story, by the way. I looked at the brand analytics for this product and I my assumption going in was that this was going to be bought by by moms and 70% female and they, they're just trying to have a little get together and whatever, right? Well, the brand analytics showed it was actually 70% male. And, and that uh, when I looked at the competitor products, I saw pictures of cigars being lit and it wasn't just cream belay. And so when I realized that, and, I, and then we looked at our listing uh, for, the, for the client I was helping, their listing was focused on the female instead of the 70% male, right? They got the target demographics completely wrong. And so when you redo the listing with that in mind and you polarize the audience to say, hey, this is for the 45 year old male who's probably single, wants to impress the ladies, but also smokes cigars, buy this product. Right. It'll make you look like you're a restaurant. Interesting. So, so those are the sort of things that need to upgrade your listing and your, and your, and your, and your info. And I'll give you one more example because it, this, this conversation does take some time to sit in. Right. So like I'm, right. when I say focus on your target demographics, right. And one of my phrases I've been throwing around of late and I get in a little bit of heated um, conversation on this topic because people think this is a really weird metaphor, but you know, if I were to ask you who is the target demographic of a Russian mail order bride, what right. would you say? You, I heard this the other day, so I'm going to think about what I thought about when I first heard this. I heard this example on Rob Stanley's podcast, but Russian mail order bride, you're probably thinking what single man or even hopefully single. Yes. Hopefully single man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm assuming if I were to guess, hopefully single man, 
probably older, maybe like widowed, maybe like or yeah. just lonely. Yeah. So, so I think all those different. Are, I think all those things are correct. But but then when you talk to somebody like, what's the target demographic of a toothbrush? They're like anybody with teeth. Right. That's not a target demographic, right? That's like not too at broad. all. Exactly. Yeah. And so the I'll, and I'll give you the answer. And and I love this conversation point because it's so obscure and so odd. It's memorable, right? And that's why I do this. But like when you really laser down and think about like who would really order a Russian mail order bride, all the things you said are true. But but the number one target audience is three time divorced truck drivers. And that's because you know that that audience has been burned more than three times. They don't want to date anymore. They probably have a little bit of income and they just want to feel loved. And when you when you really express that metaphor that deep, you really understand that's what a true target demographic is. And then all of your content, and all of your feedback and your, your copy and your images chases that one audience. So if you were to sell a wristband with, um, with the ability to click a button and get out of it um, some hand sanitizer, you, would, you, could, you could foresee like, okay, who would buy this, right? Is it kids going to the playground, going to school? Is it the sports runner who wants to run into Chipotle? Or is it the mom who's going to the grocery store? Probably all of those things are realistically possible target demographics. Right. Do not pick all of them. Pick one and and then go all in. So if you have that product, you want to market to both those audiences, make multiple listings. Have one listing for the kids, one for the sports runner, one for the mom. And have all of the images target that demographic. And if you do that, your conversion rates will be considerably higher. Why? Because you polarized the audience. You know within five seconds who's supposed to buy this product, who's supposed to use it. If you try to go all of that and you put pictures on all of them, your conversion rate will be a tenth of what it should be. And then if your conversion rate sucks, your sales suck and you don't grow the brand. So you're taking, you're almost taking the each different product, the same product, multiple different ways, how that the target audience is, make it super stand out. This is my micro niche. This is who I'm hitting hard. And that's all I'm focusing on for that one listing. Yes. Can take, take that same product, but then make it over to, like you said, mom's in grocery stores or something like that. Then it's all moms. It's all like walking around grocery store or shelving. That's how they use it. That's how you do your videos, their listings, EBC content, everything. Everything needs to have continuity. And, and if you do that, you will convert better. And what happens when you convert better? You rank better. And when you rank better, you get more traffic, which then you then convert. It's a cycle that goes together. And, that, and, and at the end of the day, like when I, when I get on a sales call with a potential client, I tell them we do two things at my Amazon guy. We grow your traffic. And we do that through SEO and PPC and we improve your conversion rates. And we do that through catalog management, doing the template dirty work, changing the brand names, building parentage, all of that garbage work that nobody wants to do. Also no <laughs> agency wants to do, right? Great. Like we do all that. And then we also do design like A plus content. So when you do those two things, you grow traffic, you improve conversion rates, you grow sales and we grow sales faster than anybody I know. Is there any downside to doing that and putting in all that work to list it out? individually is there anything that can be a downside to doing that well uh, feel free to go and give a little more context into this like just the amount of work you're talking about when you do multiple listings or what do you mean yeah well i mean like in terms of ranking does it take longer to rank a product that in that context or would it no. take uh would it take uh i'm trying to think in general like i'm i'm trying to pull coals in it just because like even though there might not be this is me trying to see like hey if if this is the right way to do it, why isn't everyone talking about it? Maybe if it's it was harder, why, it's harder. Well, I was going to say, is it just yeah. the time consumption of, of doing it that way? That's what's so difficult. Well, I, I mean, I mean, people will, will do their SEO for the search terms. They'll put their 250 characters in and then be like, Oh, I set my SEO. Let me go focus on something else. Now let me go launch 10 more products. Well, Easy, in reality, yeah. like it, you should be running three phases of, of SEO. Like we have a public SEO plan where we run three phases. Phase one, it's all about indexing. Phase two is about incremental indexing called the pink word update. Look at your brand analytics dashboard. There's your five second hack today, by the way. Go look at your brand analytics dashboard. Look at your target demographics. We talked about that. And then also look at the pink word section to see what non-value keywords you are currently having in your search term field, which we do purposely include in phase one for maximizing indexing, but we pull them out in phase two to increase additional keywords. And finally, phase three, throw out everything I just talked about in phase one and phase two and redo it all again, focused on keywords and rank 20 through 50. Focus your title, your A plus content, put your A plus content 
heavy copy amounts, put it in the alt text because Amazon claims they don't index A plus content, but they totally do. And the reason I know this is because I've put Spanish behind one alt text photo, didn't put Spanish anywhere else. And within three days index for Spanish. So you do all these things. That's a lot of work, right? Like it, but it would be like analogous to me saying, Hey, I'm going to start a PPC campaign with $10,000 budget. And I'm never going to alter my keywords, never going to adjust my bids. But that's exactly what people do with their catalog. That is exactly what they do with their SEO. And they do not realize the sales they're leaving on the table. And that work is not sexy. It's harder to articulate. It's harder for me as an agency to even pitch it, by the way. Like the right. value prop on that is, is massive, but harder to prove. And so that's why it took 600 videos before I started going viral, right? Like, like it, the message is just starting to get out there. And now the proof is in the pudding. And we've grown, we've grown dozens of brands to a million dollars per month using this methodology. But it's harder, right? Much harder than just simply running a PPC campaign. So because you're doing this, you have almost like this, um, you have this strategic way to launch products or to get products out there and to adjust their game or their competition, whatever, whatever they're coming up against, you guys have the strategic mindset coming in. And now you said six ways to, you know, beat your competition in this regards. What, what are those like six top ways that you're constantly telling your clients, Hey, if you're not doing a, B, C, or if you're doing a, B and C, you need to do D, E and F as well. So what, what are those, those kinds of things that you're talking about? So I, I like to break it down into two sections, right? You got your traffic on the right, which is your PPC and SEO and the conversion on the, on the left, which is your uh, catalog management and design work. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of, companies, a lot of agencies, a lot of brands, they, they narrow in onto one and ignore the other sections. And okay. so all ships rise together when you focus on all of those topics simultaneously. And it's very important that you do so. And that's why a, a true full service agency brings a lot more value, right? If we, if we can offer a value prop that goes across these categories, then you, you also have your SEO linked into your PPC campaign structure. Right. You also have your SEO linked into your design structure. If you just go outsource to Fiverr, your A plus content, you might get a pretty decent aesthetics on your design. You know, hopefully they speak English and, you know, don't have typos, um, but you won't have an SEO technically inclined design. Right. You, you will miss. Well, you won't have like like, you know, just to throw some more hacks out there. If you don't have a product grid in your A plus content, your average order of value could be higher. Right. You could add a link. And, and, let, and there's a variety of ways you can do a product grid. And when I talk about product grid, I'm talking about listings that are linked to each other, not through parentage, but in the A plus content itself. And you could have a good, better, best model, right? Take the profit. You know, one of my favorite episodes on the profit, he's like, he was, he's kind of like Shark Tank for those that don't know. He did an right. episode with a drum company and they made three drums because previous to that, they just personalized everything. But then he had a good, better, best model, a couple hundred dollar item, a few hundred dollar item and a thousand dollar item. Well, you can comp compare and contrast the good, better, best when you have it in an A plus content module and say, here's the additional features that you get. Another way you could do a product grid would be to uh, show the other colors or other variations of said product. Or another way is like, hey, you know, we sell uh, we sell a wheel, uh, but we also sell a widget and we also sell a cup. And and then your average order value goes up because you you get them to buy one product and they're like, well, if I like these guys for this product, I'll probably like them for these other products. And then your average order value went from one to 1 1.10 because then 10 out of every customers, one out of every 10 customers buys a second product. Sure. So those are the sort of holistic things that companies need to do. And, and, and I'll tell you what companies need to stop doing. They need to stop looking for uh, a solution that will game the system like uh, black hat tactics, uh, gamifying reviews, using external traffic in ways that Amazon, you, you, I mean, like, you know, if you're doing this, right? Like it's, it's, there's going to be a, uh, an end point to your strategy and it's going to stop working. Right. Um, as an agency over the last couple of years, I struggled with this question, right? Like I wanted to be the solution on every front with every problem and every, every solution too broad. So we had to focus in within seller central. And so the question, um, I get off asked frequently is, do I need to run things outside of Amazon. Now, I do think the future does favorably look at running external traffic, but I think it's negative on doing product inserts with, you know, a $10 gift card to leave me a review, right? Like breaking yeah. Amazon policy will get you in massive trouble. 
you'll win short term. Absolutely. You won't get caught for a few months, but then when it catches up, you will destroy your business. And then you'll be left on the hook for a few hundred thousand dollars in cogs and you won't be able to sell it because you're banned. Interesting. So what, so when you're breaking all these things or breaking them down to why are, I, I, there's, there's a lot of different paths you can go down in that regards. So what is it that makes it so it or most Amazon sellers do you think are in it for the short term to win? And then they're just out in six months. Like why, why no, do you think not. People, Yeah, any, anybody that's in it for a six month sprint will lose money in my opinion, right? You can't just buy a business and reflip. It doesn't work. Right. Um, or you can't just start a business and flip it, right? Your payout. I mean, the number one payout you get when you, as an entrepreneur is to sell your business. That's your number one payday. Um, but if you do it too soon, you're leaving multiples on the table, you're leaving, uh, all the growth. And so like the next two years on Amazon, your EBITDA is going to go up significantly, like 40%, no doubt about it. And, and now you got a lot of stupid money entering the space and people are going to buy you at a higher multiple than you ever could have got. But if you just hold on for another year or two, it's going to go up even more. Right. And, and that's, and that's the question, right? So like how, don't try and time the market, make personal decisions, but <clears throat> But structurally speaking, now is a great time to grow an Amazon brand. So and where where is that growth happening? Like, let, let's go there. Like, is it international or is it different marketplaces? We could even just talk domestic, right? So like, obviously, right. if you go to Canada, you're going to increase your revenue, another 7% growth. You go to Germany, 35%. Go to UK, 13 to 15%. But your sophistication goes up with that diversity. Um, a lot of people have been talking about diversification of your portfolio for a long time. And increasingly so, that's no longer necessary, right? Like you don't have to be in these international markets to grow. If you just look at grocery, for example, grocery grew 35% year over year. Now that's obviously due to COVID. Uh, and, and meanwhile, beauty and sports, they dropped 35%. So the market shifts, comes and goes. But, you know, you know, if you want to be a betting man right now, go buy the travel brands right now, right? Like travel is going to come back and it's going to come back with a bite, and so maybe that travel pillow guy who's got 10,000 units sitting in the warehouse. God bless, like, the, travel, God bless the travel pillow industry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like they want out. They're just like, I've been sitting on this inventory for a year. You could probably pick them up pennies on the dollar right now. And then like six months down the line from now, when everything returns back to normal and it will, then you will bank major bucks. So right. you got to take a little bit of risk. Depends on what you're looking to do, right? And, and, and the aggregators are not going to be buying anything related to COVID masks or otherwise, they want they they are thinking long term. They do not want a fad product. They're not buying your fidget spinner brand that you made, right? Like they want a staple item. And so, if they want a staple item, then that's what everybody else wants. That's what the private equity wants. That's what the real business management wants. So, can you can you ride a wave with a fad item? Absolutely. Do people make a killing? Absolutely. But you're not going to be able to flip a fad item. Okay. So, do you? So Thrasio, in your context, they're not buying the brand or like the products behind it. They're buying just the inventory and what people are going to need as a staple. You're calling it staple products, right? right. So, so they are totally buying the brand. They're also buying the community behind the brand. So one of the things I haven't talked about yet is community building. So, sure, sure. you know, if you buy that Russian uh, mail order bride community and you're talking to truckers, what, what's the top five problems that truckers have, right? Like, they, they, they're on the road all the time. They need travel. Um, they don't, you know, their house is not being upkept and they need, they want a travel companion. So they probably like cats or maybe dogs. I don't know which is easier on the, on the road. I'm not a truck driver, but, but like you would build a community solving every one of those components. Right. The thrasties of the world will buy brands that build communities. It, 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 and it makes a lot of sense because if you're selling a widget, let me just see what's on my desk here. I apparently have a harmonica for some reason. Gonna My one-year-old girl uh, brought that over. I also have um, a, a lighter for a candle, right? So like if I'm going to build this product right here and it's a commodity item, right? And, right. and if I'm going to try and build that out, um, I'm going to structurally be competing against other commodity items. Now, if I could build a community somehow, probably easier with the harmonica. We'll switch to that one, right? So if I wanted to build a community with the harmonica, it'd be significantly easier because I would go out and give free music lessons. I would go out there and say, here's all the cool ways you can use the harmonica, or here's how to get started using a harmonica, or here's the intermediate strategy, here's the advanced strategy, and build all this content to help those consumers, right? Give away free sheet music with every purchase. Give away something, add value. That's community building. 
And, and if you are just simply brown boxing your item without branding and you're not offering that value, you're missing out on the exponential growth of your brand. Right. So like uh, one of my good friends names, Andre Lozovic, he owns new wave swim buoy. You look at his Instagram, you just type in new wave swim buoy on Google. Look at his Instagram. It is plaster filled with community building. One of the best community builders I know. He gives away his product for free if you will post a picture of yourself using it. And who is most likely to do that? Hot babes. Hot babes want to show off. So they get the towel, they get the swim buoy and everything else. Well, now he's got a community and then he's got an attractive community that other people want to participate in because they want to be like that. They want to be hot. They want to be a babe or they want to be with a babe. And then they reshare and they like and they comment, et cetera. That's, that, that community building could be seen as a little bit more shallow. Uh, than my harmonica example. Still built, yeah, still community. It's still community. And, and effectively, it's a community. And that's free advertising, right? And, and and so, like, that's the sort of thing that brands need to do more of. And simply just launching a product and running $10,000 PPC campaign is insufficient in 2021. So how do you know that you're doing the right kind of brand building in that context? Like, how do you quantify, I'm doing being successful, you can have a bunch of followers like that, but if that translate to sellers, like if I'm going to Thrasio and say, hey, I have this like 10,000 person following on Instagram, they're going to say, yeah, how many, I'm assuming they're going to say, how does that translate over into like sales or do they even care about that kind of stuff? Like what, what, what is that? How does that translate to dollars and cents at the end of the day? Well, I mean, you could take something like reviews, right? So like, I don't know, Ryan, I'll put you on the spot here. Like what would you value a single review at? Just throw a dollar figure out. Oh, you're talking about like, um, Product review. Like if I, if I could get one, um, probably like, probably $10, right? So, so that's fairly close to my number. I would say 15. Okay. And, and so let's say your listings have 10,000 reviews. Well, there you go. Times that by 15, that just increased the value of selling your brand by what? $150,000 or whatever. Right. So like there's a huge opportunity to extrapolate value in quantifying the metrics behind what you've built. It's not just a PL. It's not just the cost of goods into your marketing budget minus out all of your expenses. They're not just going to pay for that. They're paying for everything. How many domains do you own? Right. So, like I talked about pivoting to Amazon aggregators. Well, I went out and bought Amazon aggregators.com, FBA acquirers.com, and every other iteration I could possibly think about because I'm a businessman looking visionary looking forward. And then I built an aggregators page where I've built trust in the Amazon community. If you want to sell your brand, just go to amazonaggregators.com. Give me your information. I will introduce you to the aggregator that I think will take care of your brand. Maybe you want to be, maybe you want to stay on. Maybe there's a particular aggregator that has a better model for you, right? So like there's a way to be both a trust building member of the community, but also be an entrepreneur and take advantage of, of your piece of the pie. And the same thing could be applied to product businesses, right? Like you sell on Amazon and you build out these things and you add value and you give and you give, and it's the Gary V model, right? Like I literally am sharing every trade secret, every business structure thing that I'm working on right now in public, like on this, on this pod right here, right? Like you could ask me any question. I would give you the answer. You know yeah. No one paid 1997 for, uh, for this course. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so there are many people that do sell education and content to sell on Amazon. And, and for, for some, that's a great fit. Um, but, but at the end of the day, like by building a community, you build a cult that cult will follow you. And then at later point down the line, once the cult is like, Hey, I've been following this dude. I've been taking from Steven. I've been taking his content. At some point they call me up and say, Steven, take my money. And I don't even have to ask at that point. And that's exactly what my sales funnel is built. And you need to do the same thing with your products and you need to build value, give value and build a great product and build a community. And then people will buy your product. And, and that's how, that's how it's done. That's, that's the key to success in my opinion, in, in business and in general. Is that the number one thing that people are missing on is building the brand like the right way, the smart way, or is it like, what's the number one thing that people are just misfiring on still, even in 2021 that you're seeing either your customers or in general? People are looking at data and they're making decisions purely on a spreadsheet. That's the mistake they're making. Now, by the way, I've got an MBA. I'm a numbers guy. We didn't talk about chess as much as we, you know, all of your promotional material was like chess. And I was going to say, we, we can work this yeah. back in. Like yeah, we, we, we're on the home right? stretch. <laughs> so, so like if, 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 we, if we look backwards and say, okay, I just ran through the beginning, middle game and end game of a chess match. The E4. You can now see, we started with the E4. 
Yeah. And you can now see um, every variation of potential backwards, right? Like in the chess world, you only need to win with one pawn promoting to a queen at the end game. And you just have to win by a pawn. And, and, and you know, novice chess people will be like, oh, you just beat me by a pawn. Well, in reality, every position and move that we made in this chess game was to win by a queen by getting that pawn to the other side of the board. And, and so what seems like a small edge in reality translates to an eight times, nine times EBITDA building your brand when you promote to the queen. And so a small edge does create that exponential value. And, right. and so a lot of people are swinging around their rooks and swinging their queens in the early game right now, a la, let me put in a lot of PPC and I'll put in a shiny object. And they forget a lot of the pawns and the bishops and knights you got to trade in the middle game to run your tactical play, to get that checkmate in, you know, move 26 out of nowhere, to do the sacrifice upgrade trading that's required in a chess match, or to win by positioning, right? And the slow and steady race of controlling the center of the board uh, and, and getting your pawn across the board. So, um, you know, just, just to tell you a little bit about my chess background, I, I played in the US Open back in the day. I won the under 1800 when I was in high school. Um, lots of fun. Uh, definitely miss that. I, I taught chess lessons when I was growing up in high school and college, and that's how I paid for a lot of the things I did in life. Um, and, and it made me an entrepreneur, right? Like I've always been giving service and always been teaching and always been, you know, I sold chess sets. And, you know, the first first thing I ever sold online was actually a, a Magic the Gathering card, original trading card game Sliver yeah. from Stronghold. Um, and, then, and, then I, and then I bought, you know, 200 chess sets from a wholesaler and then started hawking those things, all right? And because I was a chess teacher, people would just buy whatever I put in front of them and then you make a margin, right? Same right. concept we've been talking about this entire podcast, add value, teach, share, reveal, and then they will buy your product. So you as a teacher coming in, they're like, Hey, I actually need to practice or I need to play with somebody. My teacher, Steven has these, this product. I want to continue to get better. I'm going to go with the equipment. If you're like a band teacher or any kind of teacher in this regards, you have some sort of authority over them. They're going to come back to you time and time again in this arena, essentially. That's what you're talking about. That's exactly right. So as a 16-year-old kid, I was showing up and saying, hey, buy this chess set for me for $25. My cost of goods was seven. Made a killing, right? And rinse and repeat go to every household next to me. Um, and by the way, triple-weighted set chess pieces, if you take them through an airport, they look like bombs. Don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go with your travel set, not your uh, heavy duty one that you <laughs> that you're not traveling. I just want to give a couple shout outs to people watching Melissa Simonson over at Empowery. Uh, great work, Ryan. Uh, shout out on interesting topic, and then Yoni Kaminsky, uh, loving this guys. So we appreciate obviously the social commentary. If you guys have questions for Stephen or myself, definitely feel free to add in the comment section below, whether it's on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. Um, I don't want I don't want to keep. Uh, taking all the content and like absorbing myself. This is something that I'm constantly like writing notes mentally to apply later. So when you are, what's kind of the biggest like surprise for you from Amazon sellers, like kind of in 2021, we talked about, you know, dominating that, that middle, that beginning in the middle of your board. What's kind of that, that piece, if you will, of that takes people from like, okay, Amazon sellers to eight, nine, you know, billion dollar sellers like what's that like last finishing touch that people are missing or don't get scalable products you've got to constantly be adding products to your portfolio and i'm okay. not talking variations if you build a 1000 SKU variation account you are less attractive to an amazon aggregator for purchase who would prefer to buy a 10 SKU account with with 80 of the sales coming on three SKUs. But you have to have a roadmap to constantly be launching products because the, the life cycle of a product is increasingly shorter on Amazon. You could say it's between one and two years. Um, and, and a staple product that can beat that, uh, that data set and last two, three, four years will be far superior. There are other things, um, you know, like, by the way, I, get, I only get one out of three things right, in my opinion, when it comes to launching on Amazon. And so, and, and that's sufficient, right? Like if you do right. one, one out of three product launches fails and loses money, one out of three breaks even, probably still going to disco the break even one. But if that one out of three is exceptional, pays for all three products and it's your rinse and repeat, 
I launched a hot sauce one time, and this sweet heat hot sauce was a phenomenally liked product. I branded it for under Monster, right? Um, <clears throat> now, lo and behold, I, I do everything correct. I spend money on building a label, and and it's got a great product, and I get great reviews, and everybody loves it. Well, lo and behold, I ship it to Amazon, and I say to myself, I'm going to pay Amazon to do my prep. And they bubble wrap my glass, and I thought, oh, it's done. I don't have to worry about boxing this sucker. Well, what did Amazon do? They took my four and a half pound glass bottle and they shipped it out in padded envelopes. What the heck, Amazon? Right. So, like, those are the examples that even experts get wrong when they're just like WTF. And, and that's the sort of thing that throws people off in this day and age. They're like, how could Amazon be so incompetent? Like, clearly, they knew that putting this into the padded envelope would allow for massive shattering and, and barbecue sauce going all over the place in the mail. Right. Like, clearly. Right. They would know that if you asked anybody strategically high up in Amazon, they would know that this was the intended outcome. But the metrics that they do on their staff from top to bottom do not represent what's in your best interest as an Amazon seller. And this is why I exist as an agency, because we navigate these problems, right? Like, I don't have an Amazon insider out there telling me all the secrets. Mm -hmm. We solve these problems by hiring technicians, not marketers, technicians who troubleshoot problems like my hot sauce mess. What a hot mess that was. But and, sh sh there we go. Yeah. And, and I discontinued that product in shame, right? Like utter shame. And, and I was like, how did I do everything right and get one thing wrong? And, and the business was done for right now. I looked at the margins at the end of the day and I was like, man, this cogs are too high. Nobody wants to spend $15 on a single bottle, right? Like, so probably bad product to begin with low margin business, grocery, et cetera. But nonetheless, um, you've got to take care of your product end to end and ignore Amazon in terms of them helping you. They will not. And that's true of every component of their business. You, if you sell in supplements, by the way, don't start your first business in supplements. Don't do that. It's terrible. <laughs> Please <idea>. don't. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Bad uh, idea. Uh, your your PPC clicks are $5 on average, and you have to have an ISO certified certificate of analysis even to show up to the game these days on a product SKU level, not an account topicals level anymore, like it was last year. And so like, those are the sort of complications, right? And I've got 15 supplements clients, right? So like we have a ton of supplements business. No, I don't want more supplements business. If you're a supplement seller, I don't actually want your business, but yes, yeah, <laughs> um, it's not enjoyable work, but we do it and we're good at it. Uh, and, and somebody has got to do that work. But at the end of the day, there are so many things you have to troubleshoot for as an Amazon seller. And, and it's very, very difficult work. And you have to have the right fortitude mentality. You got to have BANT, budget, need, authority, uh, and timeline to get where you want to go on Amazon. So what, um, when you're talking about your competition, what's the number one thing that people just don't see coming from their competition? Is it them? Uh, I'm trying to think because yesterday it was like, it, it kind of like it, we had Dima Kubrick of Sellerize. He was like, the thing I did to just launch and test products was purchase all the top sellers, look at them Ooh, and say, like, this is the, this is the greatest, like, I didn't even think about buying them to kind of like look at them in general, because if you're going to test products, you, you need to know what your listings look like and how they arrive. Look at prep packaging, look at how they arrive in Amazon, like your uh, barbecue sauce bottle. If it arrived in a padded package, you're like, well, this idiot is sending me barbecue sauce in a padded package. Let's have me at least put it in a box. So it's going to protect itself if they happen to put it in a padded package. That solves one problem there. Um, but I, I don't know. Are there other things like as a competitor and you want to get into like a space that's, you know, decently competitive? I won't say like it's crowded, if you will. What's the best ways to to look at it and see if it would be successful or not or if it's even worth your time? I'll, I'll give two pieces of advice on this. The first is don't join a crowded competitive landscape product. Don't do that. That's my first what piece. Would consider, what would you consider crowded first off? So, so if there are more sellers than there are buyers, right? Like proportionally, right? Right. Um, and, and the data that's available in the helium tens, the jungle scouts of the world, everybody has this data, right? This leads me to my second piece of advice. Ignore the data. Instead of worrying about whether you're entering a crowded space or not, do what you know, right? Like if you're going to get into the supplement space, you better have a chemistry degree. You better be able to look for the edge of the product, right? So like I have a huge, huge fan of people who get into the space and know what they're talking about, right? So so Mina uh, Elias, he right. has- Friend of the show. 
yeah, he is an amazing asset in the supplements world, right? And he's a chemist. And so he could tell you how every formula is built and how he's working on the next one to beat the other supplements products. But if you're Joe Schmo, who's never even taken a supplement, you don't even work out and you're 300 pounds, don't even think about showing up to supplements. Like terrible idea, right? If you are a dentist, cool. Sell me every dentist product you know and understand and can articulate and you can be part of your brand's face. Do that. If you want to get into fitness equipment and you don't lift dumbbells, that's a terrible idea, right? Like you got to know the product you're selling. Now, now obviously it's possible for, for somebody to go across those boundaries and find a niche that nobody's tapped, right? At the end of the day, it's easier to be the only guy selling something than then to be the best guy selling something. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a huge advantage. But if, but if you are going to go down this path and think about how to launch new products especially if you're a new Amazon seller and you don't have a big experience with this, stick to the products you understand and that you're passionate about. You will go way farther. If you are also already successful, maybe you're not passionate about your current product offering, at least tap into your community and ask them what they are passionate about and build the product line that way. Build your cult following. Build towards your target demographics. Try and gain traffic, improve your conversion rates, and build a community. Those are the best pieces of advice I can give anybody. Absolutely. And then finally, I guess like in the in the last part before we have to wrap up today, if you're if you're beating your competition both domestically, like within category domestically, and then I would say the last piece would be internationally. If you're doing it that way, is it taking your best sellers and just not just throwing them into any market? What's that strategic way to do it? Is it on a if you're selling in .com, it's then North America, then it's you know Europe, Asia, um, Japan. What, what's kind of that strategy to keep ahead of the game there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Canada is vastly underrated, lower cost, easy to obtain. Um, and, and so I think Canada should be the starting point. And then Germany should be number two mm -hmm. and followed by the UK. Um, but, I, but I would say you, you shouldn't even look at these things until you're at least a $1 million brand per year. Um, because there's so much upside in the U S market that like everybody and their dogs. So like my clientele is shifting right now to international sellers who sell in the U S and what they're doing is, is they're, they're following the Alibaba model. They're going to China, they're grabbing a product and they're private labeling it and they're putting it in the United States. So if that's happening, why would you be going to the European and the Asian markets if everyone else is coming to the U S market? It doesn't make any sense. The U S market is still the number, like, like Amazon is half our economy until you've got the half economy rate, forget the worldwide economy, especially then you don't have to deal with that taxes, customs, complications, and a lot more risk. Uh, so I, 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 I'm a very big fan. Um, and, and I'll make one prediction here. If you want to beat the Chinese and the aggregators as a mom and pop Amazon seller, make it in America, go figure out how to crack a problem. I haven't figured out how to crack this by the way. Um, and I've talked to everybody I know how to make B2C products in the United States. And I'm not talking about grocery supplements and, other, and beauty products. Like I'm talking about everything else, like your household items. Figure out how to make that in the United States and you will win. And do so, by the way, with vertical control, right? Like take the raw resource all the way to the packaged good. And if you can do that, you will succeed and beat people in ways that nobody else can fathom. I'm assuming this because of time money and effort like the quickness that you can source from product and then put it in market the, that the time is number one key in that component right that's what you're touting it, it, it's not about time it's about control right so like the next black swan event that comes up it's going to be bigger than covid by the way like people are like oh we're going to get back to normal and i'm thinking to myself how is this going to snowball right like that's how i'm thinking right like i'm i'm thinking like <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking like the 11th Jew from World War Z with Brad Pitt, right? Like they go to Jerusalem and, and they're like, why did you guys build the wall? And, and, they're, and they're like, there's a collective of 11 Jews. 10 Jews say to do one thing and the 11th Jew automatically says to do the other. And so be the 11th Jew when it comes to this metaphor. And, and some people will think I'm being sacrilegious, but I, I just think it's a fascinating storyline and metaphor. Right? Like think about what people aren't solving for and solve for that. And so I am looking at this structure situation and I think all of the, the international things are going to collapse at some point inevitably. And if you source things locally, you'll have vertical control and you're going to win. Now, is it hard? Absolutely. Are the margins atrocious right now? Yeah. I don't know how to solve for any of that. But, but if you do, you're trying you to, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to. 
So yeah, would you say that, and then also logistics, or in terms of like, uh, you know, full, 3PL? full vertical control, complete vertical control. So product, raw resource, logistics, packaging, brand, all of it. Own every single thing end to end. If you do that, you're going to be the railroad company from back in the day who owned everything. Is there is there anyone that you think is like? Is there a problem right now that you think is on the verge that would would be that that kind of like you said snowball effect for that eleventh? person yeah i i, do you, I do you have a prediction i i do not know of anybody that's solving it this way no i i, I am the lone wolf prophesying on this question and start, start to get your cult following then yeah 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 <laughs> You'll be right. exactly so like I, well, i'm being truthful and admitting like right. i don't know how to solve these things i just know i need to <laughs> right well, so like well, i'm a visionary thing. i'm a visionary looking for the integrator to help me out come on integrator show up at my door so <laughs> Well, Stephen, really quickly. So, when when COVID happened, what do you think the things that we take that we didn't solve before this event, now that we have supply solved, hundred percent supply, supply chain. chain. People are so like, that's where innovation comes from. Yeah, like, like they thought just in time supply chain management was a good idea. It's not. You need a year supply of your goods right now. If you bought a year supply of your goods in the last year, guess what? You just made a lot of money. Why? Because commodity pricing is jacked up right now. The government's printing out massive inflation. Everything, everything that you know that is true from the past is going to change in the next two years, all of it. And so if you lock and load and you try and figure out how to solve for these things with long-term vision, you will beat the short-term velocity changes in a black swan event like COVID. Awesome. Well, I think that makes sense. Like in terms of staying heavier competition, solve for the problems that you don't see yet, obviously, whether it's your competition now on Amazon or just in terms of like the ecosystem that is e-commerce in general. So are you, uh, is there anything in general that, uh, where, where can people learn to uh, more information about you or your team? Where can they find you out? Yeah, I, I think our YouTube channel is the number one place that we're building our community. That's youtube.com slash my Amazon guy. You can also reach out. If you got a question about anything I talked about today, you can send us an email to podcast at my Amazon guy.com. Or check us out for a coaching session or hire us as an agency at myamazonguy.com. Awesome. I'm already subscribed, but Stephen, thank you so much for hopping on today. We appreciate your time and just dropping some knowledge, staying ahead of your competition here at Crossover Commerce. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Have a good one. And everyone, again, thanks for joining us live on Crossover Commerce. We appreciate Stephen Pope. He had a bolt because he has so much on his plate right now, but I appreciate his time dropping his knowledge here on Crossover Commerce. Thank you again for uh, tuning in. Again, tomorrow we have... Uh, we have a bunch of more live sessions that are lined up again this week. We go live four times this week. On Wednesday, we have Tyler Jeffco of Seller Accountant. So again, tune in tomorrow to make sure you don't miss that. We're going to be touching on how to set up an e-commerce business, uh, excuse me, uh, how inventory velocity affects profitability. So if you are watching this live or on Team Replay, go ahead and make sure you subscribe uh, to all of our social channels to make sure that you know when we go live. Again, we have a Crossover Commerce Facebook page. That's the best way that's brand new this week. Go ahead and search for that, Crossover Commerce on Facebook. You're going to be notified with just e-commerce knowledge that I bring to the forefront, but then also um, all of our live episodes, and then you can watch on replay as well. If you don't do that, go ahead and subscribe to wherever you can listen to your podcast. Again, that's on uh, Amazon, Spotify, Google, uh, Apple Podcasts, truly anywhere where you can a download or listen to a podcast. We will be there. Just search Crossover Commerce. Thank you again to Stephen Pope of My Amazon Guy. This is Crossover Commerce. Again, everyone continue to work hard, stay true to yourself, and uh, we'll catch you next time on the show. Take care.